Tom, who do we have tonight on our show? We got Chris and we got uh, Dave Anthony. Good. That's it. Thank you very much. Would you want to tell us anything a bit about them, Tom McCoy? Well, Chris for Cross and Sills, uh, a former castmate from A Christmas Carol 2021. He is a teacher at Southeast Regional Voc Tech. I don't. You got. You got to find a better name, dude. Because uh, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't pick it. You know. I'd well, love to take the initiative. <laughs> and uh, comedian, writer, and host of the Dollop and West Wing thing. Dave Anthony, who has been uh, battering my eardrums for the past two years as I binged his <laughs> theories from uh, beginning to end. Wow. Also founder of Planet Change 10 and guest star on shows such as Veep, Arrested Developments, and uh, what was it, The Office? Oh, yeah, the, that show, The Office. Yes, The Office, yeah. That, yeah, I've, I've heard of that show. That Well, that's great. Well, both of you, thank you so much for coming here. So we have a really um, interesting discussion that we wanted to talk about tonight, which really has to do with this remarkable virus called COVID. You know, one of the things about the I am approach is um, there are four domains, the home domain, the social domain, the I see domain, how I see myself, how I think other people see me and the biological domain, uh, the biological domain of our brain and body. These four domains interact all the time, but I truly believe we respond the best we can. And because the domains interact, a small change can have a big effect. What could be a smaller change than a virus? I mean, think about it. A virus which has entered into our world, enters into our cells uninvited, and creates what we have seen a massive change in both our home and social domains and our IC domains, how we see ourselves, how we think other people see us, and of course now our biological domain. So with that as sort of a foundation, we're gonna be talking about COVID and schools and how this has had an impact on what is arguably one of the most fundamental expectations of our children in this country to attend a school. So with that in mind, Let's just get right into it. Christopher, you are a teacher. Dave, you are, I believe, a parent. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark is a parent. Uh, Tom has been a student. Um, and I'm lucky enough to have been an adolescent at some point and actually gone to school. So where do we want to start? Before we do that, Dave, could you tell us a little bit about the dollop West Wing thing and the stuff that, that brings you into this. Uh, yeah, so The Dollop is a podcast. It's a American history podcast that I do with another comedian. And I, I basically read him a story from history that he's never heard, and he just kind of reacts to it. Um, I'm very much a leftist, so it comes from a leftist point of view. I, um, I guess it's modeled on Howard Zinn and how he sort of approached history. So Love um, it's Howard like it. Yeah, it's like an homage to him, basically. But isn't it more um, how, how Howard he approached history? Well, he looked at it from right. um, oppressed people's point of view, from labor standpoint, and and you know people of color, and um, the, the history we get is the the white man's history from the top. So he looked at things more from the bottom up, mm -hmm. um, which is you know most people's history. Sure. So, sure. Uh, and then the West Wing thing is another podcast I do, which is um, the West Wing influenced quite a bit of people. And it's just a TV show, so it shouldn't be taken seriously. And so we just kind of go through the politics, the actual politics of the West Wing and how they're actually not that great <laughs> and you actually analyze them. So it's, it's more like breaking down a TV show that influenced a lot of people that maybe shouldn't have. Fantastic. I'm just curious, how did you get these ideas? Well, history, um, I've always been super into history. I had an uncle that it was a history teacher. And uh, so I just, I loved him and I got into history when I was young. And I used to have another podcast where I just talked to a friend about our lives and I didn't want to talk about myself anymore. And I was yeah. like, well, I love history. So why don't I do a podcast about history? And so I just, you know, just kind of came together from there. But I'm, I'm just a huge history guy. Terrific. And, and Chris, tell us a bit about yourself. Um, 
Well, I've, t I've taught for, you know, almost 15 years at Southeastern Regional, and um, I've loved every second of teaching. I started teaching English um, for a number of years, and then I started teaching uh, video production and performing arts for the past five or six years. Hmm. Um, I was instrumental in founding the first theater program at the school. And uh, uh, this past uh, couple weeks ago, uh, my school opened uh, its brand new theater that they had built because before, uh, before coming to the school, there was no theater. And we just, um, my superintendent has always been incredibly supportive of the program and the arts. And um, he, he uh, uh, is retiring at the end of this year. And one of his last big things was to build us this theater, which was a remarkable achievement for us. And, um, you know, I, uh, uh, outside of that, I, I do a lot of things outside of that. I'm also uh, a summer camp director. I work mm. with kids. Uh, I, I've been a summer camp director in Hanover, Massachusetts for five summers. So, uh, I worked through COVID running a summer camp as well. And, uh, we've actually run a fairly successful summer camp that we reported zero incidents of COVID over both summers. Wow, uh, that we've gone with it. So I've I've dealt with COVID pretty pretty heavily, both in the classroom and uh, as a camp director. Wow, and what what ages, what grades do you teach? Um, so I teach in high school. I teach, uh, you know, grades nine through twelve. And mm -hmm. at the summer camp, I work with kids between the age of five and fifteen, and staff members of sixteen to twenty four. Wow. Ah. Zero incidents of COVID for two years? We, we really, we were one of the few summer camps that decided that we wanted to try to provide camp to kids. We were one of the few that first summer that faced it head on um, and said, we want to be able to provide kids. And listen, we were all masked. We mm -hmm. lowered our numbers and we... Uh, we instituted cleaning protocols. We instituted everything. Um, and we had a very, again, a high level of success. And we've uh, benefited from that. And we passed on what we learned from those summers to other camps to try to help. And um, you know, I'm very proud of what we did. I'm very proud that we took the chance because there were points where they turned to us and they said, do you really want to take on this challenge, you know, in April and May, they're like, do you really think you can do this? And there were points where I, <clears throat> I didn't know if we were going to be given the opportunity. I didn't know if we were going to have that chance, but we did. And I had a wonderful staff and a uh, very supportive infrastructure through the YMCA that uh, helped produce a really wonderful summer for these kids. And um, I think there was also something very rewarding, stressful, <laughs> Stressful, but rewarding because I think a lot of parents really appreciated that we were there for their kids, especially after the school year that they had had, after being remote, after losing that connection, losing those social skills that they get. Because we're dealing with kids who are five to 15. And, you know, the thing that I've, I've had a lot of conversations with people about is right now, there's a lot of kids who've missed a developmental step. There's a lot of kids mm -hmm. that have missed uh, uh, that social interaction. And um, the past summer that we had, I, I looked at my staff and I said, you almost want to think of each kid as really developmentally like an age behind. You know, those yeah. kindergartners, those kindergartners were, were, were all remote. They missed a year. And even though they're in first grade now, they're missing steps. And everybody's missing steps all the way up the ladder. And mm -hmm. there's a real tragedy to that. Um, they, might they might still have the, the knowledge. They might still have the information. But what I always talk to people about is that there are certain soft skills that you learn at school from being sure. around people, from going to recess, from having fun with, with friends. Sure. And those are the things that were remote those are the things that were gone for a whole year right and it was so important to ha I, I, th I felt it was so important to run camp to help those kids yeah yeah dave i, I see you, you nodding your head a lot as christopher is talking what what resonates with you 
Well, I think I think the social aspect. So my son is twelve now, so eleven when it started. So he was basically getting into like, oh, this girl likes me. I like this girl. How do I talk to this girl? Like it was, and I remember that age. And it's a really important time to go through that and maneuver that and figure out how to talk to girls and if you even can. Are you too scared and all that stuff? So he he was really like at a point where he was he was having like I like this girl. What do I do? And I would talk to him and then the door came down and and i think that you know all the kids his age did miss a year of that and i think that's for that age i think that's probably the most important social thing that's going on um and as far as as far as getting them out there like i got him he has a baseball team that shut down but they started it up again and so that you could tell him coming home from his baseball practices because all they were doing was practicing no games but it made a huge difference. He's just interacting and they're being knuckleheads and they're doing what boys do. And it, and again, the, his baseball team, very masking outdoor, doing the whole thing, like wash your hands before you come to practice, everything they could do. And, um, and it's very beneficial, but there's a lot of kids that didn't have that. Like there's a lot of kids that didn't have a camp or I'm uh, sorry, Siri's talking to me. <laughs> there's a lot of kids um, that didn't have a sports team. And then they were just in the house. And I think, you know, problematic you know for a lot of kids and and how did you guys manage that how did you help your 12 year old well we had a very depressed 12 year old on our hands um mm -hmm. we could see him sort of shutting down and but again you have the the other side of it he's scared of covid he's on he's at that age where he can get on tiktok and hear stuff and he can go online and hear stuff um, so he's getting scared and he's watching the deaths like he had a little thing that he watched and, you know, the kids process it in their own way and you just kind of talk them through it. So, you know, he's got all that anxiety going on and then he's getting depressed. We actually took him and went to a small town where relatives lived for six months to, wow. get, him out of Los, to get him out of Los Angeles because um, there wasn't as much COVID there. It was like kind of more of a rural place. And and he could be a little bit more of a kid there and then we came back after six months and got him into the baseball so we kind of had to take drastic action because i saw a very depressed child mm -hmm. um, and and there wasn't any there was no other solution because you the schools were shut down and even if the schools were open i at that point i don't think we would have sent him you know back um because i didn't trust what was happening in the schools. so you know, it was it was a really diff I, you know, it's a difficult time for everybody, but everyone has their own story. Everyone's got their own child reacting in their own way. Some kids did amazing in online school. Yeah, and didn't he? He really struggled with online school. He hated it. He absolutely hated it. So mm -hmm. you know, you just you had everyone, it, every parent has to maneuver it in their own way. You know, if if it makes you feel any better. I also hated teaching remotely. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that. I have a lot of teacher friends. They, they have said the same thing. <laughs> it, it was, it, I, I, I have to tell you, and, and I really had a wonderful support structure for my administration focusing on our mental health as well. But, but I, I, I actually have, I'm, I'm very honest with people that that was probably the most, I've taught for 15 years and teaching remotely is probably one of the most miserable things I would much rather have a student cuss me out in class in front of other students than ever teach remotely again. Like I would, I, I it was one of the most just uh, demoralizing, um, just mentally draining. Um, and I mean, it was, it was horrible. And I can only imagine from, uh, and God bless you for what you did for your son. Like, it sounds like you were able to find an outlet for him. And I got, uh, you know, and, and, and we all recognize that there are other people that were not able to do that, but I'm, I'm really happy to hear that you were able to find that your son had that baseball and everything. That's fantastic that, yeah, well, that you had that. He's a crazy baseball kid. He loves baseball. He's really <laughs> good at it. So it like, we were very lucky that we had that, you know, it, it, it's like it's his joy like he loves baseball so that we were able to do it you know that really helped his mental health mm. awesome and and when when you moved to another town did he continue to do remote school 
yes. in his original town. Yeah, so we stayed in his district, and and he would get up every morning and do remote school, and and you know just like if he had been here. It's just that the difference is that we could feel more free going outside and doing stuff. It's so interesting. Go on, Christopher. I, I have a, I just have a question for you, just because with, with with remote and everything, how long? What what in, in those initial stages? What were they giving? What were they giving him to do remotely? And I know that sounds like a really obvious question, but like uh, my my school was pretty good about trying to keep the kids engaged academically and try to getting them in work that was relevant. But did you feel like they were giving your son like what what was what was the quality of the work that you were receiving like that he was doing? Was it uh, like, like what kind of work were they giving him at that point? I'm curious because I've heard lots of stories from different people about what it is that was being given well, to kids in those initial stages. It wasn't good. So it was, yeah. you know, they selected one of those online programs and it was often confusing. And uh, the teacher was always there, but she was a first year teacher and this is really hard for a first year teacher. I mean, talk about <laughs> jumping into the fire. Like I had tons of sympathy for her. It wasn't really working. Um, but the, it was just like online multiple choice sort of stuff, mm -hmm. lessons that were just online multiple choice over and over and over again. A little bit of reading to the kids, um, you know, follow along in the book, but not a lot of interactive stuff and then they'd throw up a video that would be an hour and a half and I, I would always see stuff like that and I would think well these kids are on like Twitch and they have they, they're watching a video and they have another person commenting in the corner and they're also texting at the same time and when you throw a video up it's Snoresville like they, they just don't care <laughs> right. and a lot of the a lot of the videos seem like we're just killing time that's really how it came across. But again, we're talking about they were thrown into a situation they weren't prepared for. And who knows what will happen in the next pandemic. But, right. Um, you know, if we ever have to go remote again, I would hope that our society is more prepared and has a more integrated and, and interactive educational system online. It's not it doesn't seem like it would be that difficult to come up with. But what we had was it just wasn't very good. Yeah, it was innovation is adaptation and adaptation is innovation. Mark, how old was was were your kids uh, in the beginning of the pandemic? I had a seventh grader, I had a tenth grader, and a senior. And, and what was your experience like with this? You know, it was challenging. It was, um, you know, you you know, you 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 try to make the best of it, right? Um, the senior, it. it it was tough. I mean, it started his junior year and then into his senior year. So, you know, it, things like his baseball junior year was eliminated and then the football for the senior year. And, you know, it was demoralizing because these are things that they look forward to. And, you know, to be online school, you know, in those, you know, you're not learning that well, you know, there's, you know, you're not getting the best of the best, but, you know, it's interesting, you know, I was thinking about it as we started, you know, and you started talking about middle school and some of those struggles. Um, my youngest was in seventh grade and, you know, part of, part of the joke that we talk about with middle school, it's like, gosh, if I could just block that whole period of my life out, that would, <laughs> that would be great. But, you know, and he was doing some real experiment of stuff on YouTube. You know, he was, you know, during COVID, he was getting really creative and he created his YouTube channel. And, you know, he was doing a lot of stuff that I think if he had to go into school the next day, you know, the kids would be like, oh, I saw that. Ew, what are you uh, doing? And they might have, you know, it might have shut him down, but they didn't have it. And so, you know, he kept going and going and kind of broke through this period where even if somebody said something to him, it wouldn't matter anymore. But, you know, in those early evolution stages of what he was doing, it could have gotten muffled by, you know, those critical middle school kids so you know if there's a COVID positive you know for him <laughs> to um, eliminate that you know awkward year wasn't the worst thing you know for him but you know I know that uh 
you know, a lot of people struggled through that and it was tough. It was, you know, and we tried to normalize it as much as we could as a family. And, you know, it's like, this is the agrarian era. Let's go out in the yard as a family and let's, uh, you know, let's do things together. And, you know, so, so it was interesting, but, you know, it's amazing how quickly you start to already forget. Right. And Dave, you talked about the next pandemic and I was like, Oh, yeah, I like kind of <laughs> froze up for a second. Like, really? We're going to even think about doing this again? Because I don't want to think about that again. Stretch the